Oh, the Monerotopia right. Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Buddy, happy New Hello. Year's to you guys. Howdy, howdy. Hey, How's man. it going? How's this? Is the sound okay? Yeah, sound is good. I can hear you. You can hear me. Hopefully, y'all can hear me. Yes, we can hear yes. you. How are you? Happy New Year. I'm, I'm really good. <laughs> yeah, having a good New Year so far. Awesome. Monero's uh, given us given us good reasons, extra reasons to have a good New Year. Yeah, for sure. Now, I know everyone is excited to talk about Monero. We've been pumping, but today I really want to start with the big picture and work our way down. The reason for that is that trading is kind of an emotional endeavor, right? You don't want to let your positive emotions about Monero affect how we might be viewing the macro. So we're going to start with the macro and we'll work our way towards Monero. Um, if you're on the Twitter spaces, highly recommend you get on YouTube and make sure and set your resolution to 720p. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go ahead and start. Let's start with this reverse repos. I posted about this on Twitter, actually. And what happened was some, I don't know, somebody dropped like $350 billion with the Fed overnight for New Year's, just for New Year's. We had this big spike, and we were talking about this spike last week. And if you remember, I said, this looks a little bit kind of like a capitulation wick. It looks kind of like the, uh, the momentum has already rolled over. And so, for example, if we add the Bollinger Bands to this, and this is the 200, uh, is it the 200 day? Maybe it's the 100 day. Um, you can see with Bollinger Bands, they can be tricky to use. You've got to be really careful. There's a lot more nuance to Bollinger Bands than many other different signals. But at any rate, after you've had a big bull run like we've had for the past year and a half on reverse repos, and for those that are that are new, reverse repos are just money that people and institutions park with Federal Reserve overnight. They get a small interest rate for doing so. And this, to me, this represents institutional potential, right? It, it represents dry powder of institutions. And so it was one of the ways we saw we were going into a bear market. Um, even though price was going up, the the money parked overnight with the Fed was also going up. When it comes to Bollinger, uh, Bollinger Bands, when you get a rollover like this, it's usually a kind of a momentum rollover. You see the top, the upper standard deviation come down. Um, you see it roll over. So when this happens, you start to suspect that potentially you're out of steam, especially on longer time frames uh, when you're on the daily and the weekly chart. When this happens, you, set, you say to yourself, this might be this is probably getting close to exhausted. So when you see a big spike up like this through the upper standard deviation, you really you want to suspect that 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 might not be real. That could just be an exhaustion wick. So the very next day uh, or the very next trading day, it came right back down. So to me, this looks very much like a confirmation that we could be seeing the end of the bear market, or at least we could be seeing a temporary reversal to the upside. Something longer than has happened. You know, all the other sort of uh, dead cat bounces and bull traps that we had all the way down uh, from the top. This one might be more long lived. And that was the tentative thesis that I was bringing out last week that we're, we're seeing just the early signs of this, but we want to see it continue to mature. Uh, personally, I spent a decent amount of time this week reaccumulating positions. Uh, I fully reaccumulated any of the Monero that I might have sold, um, trying to avoid this last dip. Um, everything's looking really good. Uh, let's let's go ahead and look at the Dixie now. The Dixie, I want to show you guys a, a new, a couple new things actually. Um, so we've got our Z scores here on the bottom, and if you notice these little green and red dots, this is an indicator that a friend of mine created, and it's basically an engulfing pattern detector. So the red dots essentially indicate that there was kind of an engulfing pattern on the candle before. Now, one thing that I was expecting for Dixie to do was to make a short reversal. Essentially, this is topping and reversal. It's possible we'll be back up here at some point. And I was kind of expecting that. And we got the beginning of that right here as price started going up. But then yesterday we had a, a pretty interesting daily candle where essentially we had this engulfing pattern on this daily candle. Things were looking bullish and then it just reversed on a dime and then closed lower. So that's kind of, that can often represent a liquidity run. It can represent not enough momentum to keep going up. In other words, this, this gives us the indication that Dixie might be going down soon. Now, the Z-scores down here, this is another pattern that I've detected um, in 
in the time I've been playing with Z-scores. So the darker bands up here represent longer time frame lookbacks, and obviously the shorter ones are, or sorry, the, the yellow and green down here are the shorter time frames. When you have a chart where the longer time frame Z-scores are trending downwards, it's a momentum indicator, but then your short term spikes up against that momentum and then comes back down, that is very often an indication of a liquidity run or of like a temporary, maybe a stop hunt, something like that. So we're having basically two indicators now. There's an engulfing indicator and we have the Z-score indicator that's telling us kind of the same thing. What I thought was going to be the Dixie going higher might actually end up going lower now. And in terms of a bullish thesis for risk assets, this is actually a very good thing. In fact, this was one of the pieces last week that I was saying was a conflicting signal. I didn't like how Dixie looked like it was ready to, to start going up. Um, and that was conflicting against the idea that maybe we could go on a, uh, on a larger bull run here. So that's a good thing for people holding risk assets. It's a good thing for Monero. It's a good thing for stocks. Uh, we could take a quick look at the Z-scores for all assets relative um, to each other. These, let's go to the four hour. This makes more sense on the four hour. Or maybe the one hour. Okay. So you can see that the markets are closed. Crypto is, is going solo right now. You can see that the Dixie came down at the last moment on Friday and everything else basically jumped up here to the top. Uh, silver seems to be lagging behind just a little bit, but uh, it should catch up as well. So right now, again, this is this is a little bit more cautiously optimistic than we were uh, even just last week. And again, it sort of it justifies taking bites, getting reaccumulating your positions if you have dry powder. Um, just just slowly getting back into the market. And with Monero, because we'll, and we'll talk about this later, Monero, you really want to get in there sooner rather than later. So, okay, this is the oil chart, and I added a couple things from last week. These are the standard deviation bands. Uh, the blue ones are one standard deviation, and the purple is a derivative of that. Now, essentially, this chart is a chart that looks like it's going to keep on holding in this lower triangle region here it looks like it's going to be attracted to this lower standard deviation band. And that's good. That's good because in the market profile that we're in right now, you really want oil to be steady and maybe going down just a little bit. Oil is kind of like a Goldilocks signal. You really need it to be just right. Before we had all the crazy inflation, before we entered the bear market, and typically in times past, really for the past decade, having oil being mildly positive was a good thing for asset prices. Um, you have an entire military industrial complex that's that's based on oil. You have an entire global currency reserve, reserve currency that's based on oil. But when it gets too high and we get inflation overheating, right, that's when we start to have problems with the market because it forces the Fed to take action. So right now, it's good that we are seeing oil maintain this lower bound here. We, we really want to stay in this area. We could even potentially drop lower here and that, that would be fine. So again, oil continues to give us confirmations that we are, in fact, looking at very likely a potential bottom. Um, there is another big signal that that I found with gold. So here's just the regular gold chart. Um, this is the short term. This is the 12 hour candles. So you can see that um, basically since October, we kind of bottomed and then gold has gone on kind of a nice run here. Um, we're in a bit of a rising wedge. But this has fairly positive sentiment to it. You can see that we're kind of riding the top of this wedge um, and gold could very likely continue being positive. Uh, let's take a look at this on a slightly longer time frame. So I just I don't want you guys to uh, to be confused by all the pleb lines that I've drawn there. And that's another thing we're going to talk about today a little bit is how do you draw pleb lines? Um, it's kind of an art and a science and, and it's really it's easy to get it wrong and it's easy to misunderstand and, and think that a breakout has happened when. And you just need to be careful. We'll talk more about that later. So this pleb line right here represents essentially um, a pretty good spot uh, to have broken. Uh, we've been expecting to break that for quite a while. And this is a good sign. This is especially a good sign in light of what I've seen for the past two decades on pullbacks in the stock market relative to the action in gold. So the thesis being here that gold tends to bottom first. And then the stock market tends to reverse. Out. So you can see that in most of the major crashes and or flat lines that the market has had for the past two decades. Well, starting with 2001, you can see that, uh, sorry, the blue line is uh, is the NASDAQ. And then obviously orange is gold. 
And so you can see that the NASDAQ was still on its way down, whereas gold had already started an uptrend about half a year before. And then once, once the stock market reversed, it really, once that happens, the time is actually to get out of gold pretty soon thereafter. Uh, and then you've got the same thing. If we go to the 2008 crash, uh, gold went down with it, just like gold has gone down with this bear market. But it bounced, it found its bottom and bounced up first. Again, that was, let's take a look here. Uh, that was November, or October. And then four months later, the market bottomed and then started going back up. And then they both performed really well for the beginning of this decade. Uh, you could see that again, where the market kind of flatlined in 2015. That's where the Fed started rolling over their, um, their asset purchases. They hadn't gone to a QE infinity yet. It was still like QE3 or something. I don't remember. But anyways, you can see again, gold was going up while the market was flat. We had the taper tantrum. This is where the market flatlined in 2018 because, again, the Fed was trying to stop making these asset purchases. And I think everybody knows they can't stop doing that. So while the stock market was flat, while NASDAQ was flat, gold was already in a bull market. So what we're seeing here is this right here, this point could very well have been the bottom for gold. And it would be unsurprising to see gold continue upwards. And maybe the stock market here is bottoming. Maybe it's about to reverse. So, again, this is an early sign. This is a tentative sign. It's possible we could still make lower lows on the stock market. And there's some fundamental reasons for that. If you noticed, a lot of the macro indicators had reversed, even as the stock market was making new all-time highs last year in November. And one thing that happens with insiders and market makers is things are already reversing. They're already changing their positions, even as markets are making divergent action. And this is essentially them wanting to get on the reverse side of the trade while everyone is either over exuberant or in this case at the bottom of a bear market, um, fearful and selling. And I have seen some news stories just anecdotally that would suggest it looks to me like some of these insiders and some even some of these institutions are trying to indicate that, hey, y'all should be scared. You need to sell your assets. It can be really bad this year. My guess is they want entrance liquidity, right? It's exit liquidity on the, on the top side. It's entrance liquidity on the bottom side. So again, overall, what we're seeing here on the macro is a picture that, that is continuing to develop in a positive direction. It's continuing to give us confidence that we could very well be at the bottom of this bear market or very close to it. Um, so for example, you got the NASDAQ here. This is the entire bear market. That dotted yellow line has been my target. We might not make that target. I'm becoming less and less confident as, as the weeks go by that this target will actually be made. Uh, you can see right here, that was the pre-COVID high. So NASDAQ just doesn't seem to want to go there. And then the S&P 500, this is positive action. This is the kind of action that, again, it's cautiously optimistic. You can see we've got this kind of um, uh, broadening structure here all the way through. And we've come off these bottom lines right here. We, we didn't actually touch that line down there. And then we're, we are now sitting at the top of this range, right? We, we had a double tap of the line of the resistance. We came back. And now price is trying to get right back to that line. If price makes it up to this line next week, that's very, very bullish. Now, we also have the inflation numbers coming out next week. That's going to be Thursday. Uh, that's CPI. Good CPI numbers, if things have come down, that will be very bullish for the markets overall. Now, as I talked about, I wanted to show you guys PUD lines just a little bit, ways you can draw them. And you notice that I got two drawn here. Now, it does make it a little bit messy on your charts, but let's go ahead and take a look at let's go ahead and get rid of this line for for a moment and so let's suppose we're back here and we're trying to understand what the market might do All right so your first natural line is just to connect these two points so you might do two separate things when you're at this moment right when you're oops, when you're sitting right here at this spot you would want to connect both the candle body to this candle body and you would also want to connect just the wick low just to give yourself a range so Coming down into this spot right here, again, pretending like we were back in uh, February 2022, and you would expect to touch this line right here. That would be expected. What you wouldn't be sure is if you would get into this zone down here afterwards. But the next candle kind of jumped back up, and you can see that action kind of tells you, okay, we're probably not going to end up down in this spot right there. So that's just one thing you need to be aware of on, on these PUD lines. And I like to call them PUD lines because, you know, it's like the easiest kind of TA that you can do, right? Um, so you just have to be careful. You need to be ready to get creative with how you draw them. When they break, you need to try and find ways to redraw them. 
um, for example, you need to redraw them more shallow, more steep. You need to change the timelines because as you change these timelines, you're going to notice that there are different places to connect the candle bodies. And a lot of people can draw a lot of different lines in many different ways. And so you don't want to get caught drawing lines one particular way and then have missed something very important because uh, that does happen. It's happened to me a lot of times. So the other thing that you can do here with this is connect. You can connect this, uh, these lines kind of like that. So again, we're redrawing these lines in a slightly different way. Let me just reverse all this. There we go. There we go. Uh, so you'll notice that in, when we kind of wick down below that, you can use that to draw the line more shallowly. You can see that was an important area right here. Um, and it's just, again, it's just kind of a way of, of illustrating why you need to draw these lines slightly differently. Um, the next thing we're going to look at in just a second is the comparison to the 2008 market. Um, but again, I just wanted to show you one more idea here of why you draw these lines uh, multiple different ways. So we'll move that line out of the way for a second. You can see the tops right here. This has been a very good um, bear market resistance line, but you'll notice we poked through there. And charts like to do this quite a lot. They like to poke through these lines just a little bit, which again is a way or is a reason why you want to dry, draw these lines slightly differently. So one thing you'll notice here is this was the very absolute top. And even though we had to cut through this area right here, that gives us a line that actually caught the top of right here where we broke through. So it's something you can do. It's totally okay to break through the candle bodies. There's people that say that it's not, but um, you very often have to get creative like that. And it just, it gives you more things that you can hold in your mind simultaneously. And when it comes to trading, you really need to be able to hold multiple things in your, in your head and not get too locked into one position. Okay, so let's look at something a little bit more interesting than pleb lines. Uh, and this is gonna be the 2000 and the the 2001 and 2008 bear markets as compared to where we are right now. So we've got uh, our current bear market right here. And we've got the, in blue is the 2000. And the dot-com crash was a very long crash. And we're looking at the, the NASDAQ, so tech stocks. So you can see we were kind of following along for a little bit. And then we started diverging, right? We went up where instead they went down back in the day, I guess us back in 2001 during dot-com. And right now we're basically sitting here hovering. Up, we're, we're holding price, whereas previously there was big crashes happening here. And then just recently, as of the past few weeks, really since uh, November, we have now also been diverging from the 2008 collapse. Um, interestingly enough, because the NASDAQ crashed so hard in 2000, it actually didn't crash as much in 2008. Um, the S&P 500 was a much, I shouldn't say bigger, but they crashed equal amounts in 2008. Usually the NASDAQ falls more. So what's happening here in my mind is an intuitive expiration on the potential to go lower on the, on the sort of fear trade. And when you're trading, one thing you need to keep in mind is that your ideas, your trades, your targets, these all have an expiration date. And you should think about that early on in your process and especially while you're in the trade. You need to think, when could this trade be expiring? We haven't hit my targets. Like for example, I have targets that were about five to 20% above right now. And to me, my targets are starting to expire at this moment. They were good targets. They, they were definitely in the ballpark. Um, but sociologically speaking, if these charts continue to stay above here and we don't crash, that's a very good sign that Maybe we're just not going to crash further. Um, particularly the NASDAQ looks a little bit more close, right? It's a, it's a closer call on the NASDAQ. This is the daily chart. And again, you can see that we have just now started to make a little bit of divergence here. Uh, whereas in 2008, we were already crashing. In the dot-com, we were just at the point that it started to crash. So we're just starting to, to diverge. And if we keep doing this kind of action and we go up a little bit, I think that's going to be a signal sociologically to the market that, hey, maybe we're not looking at some crazy big crash. You know, people have been fearful for the last two decades of some other some new crazy systemic risk. And in a fundamental sense, I don't really see it. There are problems and there is inflation, but I don't see the kind of systemic over. How do you say the way in which the over leverage uh, and the derivatives markets were a ticking time bomb for the market in 2000, 2008, I, I don't see the same similar situation here. Um, so that's uh, that's the macro. That's what the macro looks like to me. Things have continued to shift in the positive direction. I think it's it's basically time to start reaccumulating your positions.
Um, anything that I missed here? Oh, one more thing. It's possible that the, the S&P 500 will continue to outperform the NASDAQ. It's a very real possibility because people want to get back into the market, they, but they, they don't want to take so much risk. They're, they don't want to be in the growth stocks. And a lot of these growth stocks still look terrible, right? Tesla still looks like a terrible chart. Um, and a lot of other charts still look pretty bad. And these are stocks that people heavily speculated on. So people getting back into the market are very likely going to dip their toes at least equally as much into the more solid fundamental plays. So just know that the S&P is probably going to perform at least equally as good as the NASDAQ, but perhaps even better. It has been performing better recently. So after, after all that, now we can go talk about Monero. Monero has been really nice. Um, let's go to the, uh, let's just go to the USD chart. Now, this is another chart that I've been showing on Twitter. And it's also another really good example of things to keep in mind when you're drawing pleb lines. So we've got these two lines down here. Uh, and those are great. Those are sort of secondary resistances that we needed to break. Um, but let me delete those. But for the moment, what we can really look at are, so this line right here is an easy line to draw. You just connect the tops. And then what you can do is just slide that right down, right? And you see that's how these other two lines were drawn. We just slid that right down. And that helps because, you know, we have to sort of, we have to cut through this candle body right there, a whole bunch of them. Uh, and we have to find the best way to connect this line. So essentially, this was the, in my mind, the highest probability likelihood line that we should try and break. So, and that's exactly what we did. We came here, we tested it, we spent some time, we pushed up against it, and then we cleanly broke through. So that's really good. Um, but we're also, there's also these secondary resistances. And when you draw, again, when you're drawing lines, you need to be careful about the secondary resistances that could pose challenges. So you can see these two lines are, are pretty easy to see why, why they're drawn that way. Um, but you could try and draw them other ways. And I definitely did. Uh, I draw, I draw a whole bunch of lines and it kind of looks messy. And then you delete them all, you redraw them again, you think about it, you know, you have a coffee, you come back. So basically we broke through both of these lines now. And the good thing is that you can see that this, the area in here was only for wicks, right? For the past, uh, six months almost, it's only been for wicks. We've only wick, uh, sent wicks into that area. But now we have two candle bodies in there. And then we also have two closes above. And today is looking strong. It looks like we're going to close above that line as well. So this is very positive action. We still have these horizontal areas of significance. So places like right here where we're at or just above where we wicked. Um, we're also going to have these areas and then ultimately this area as well. And of course, the exchanges that don't like Monero don't want you buying Monero because they didn't get it for free. They like to play with the charts. I've, in my mind, and maybe I'm just being a conspiracy theorist over here, but in my mind, it looks a lot like they intentionally try to wreck the chart in many cases. Um, other times, other charts, typically when you see them break these kinds of triangles, they typically just go. Uh, so that's the conspiracy theorist in me. Let's take a look at the weekly and, and we can see, oops, you can see the weekly is also looking pretty nice. Uh, closing above this will be will be great. That that will be the first week that we closed above it. We kind of want to close the second week, but the reality is that things are looking good right now, and I very much expect we're going to go pretty quickly to this next resistance line up here. Now it's very possible that we could go up and back down, and then kind of do this for a little bit. Um, I hope not. I think it's possible that maybe we can break it faster than that, but just be aware that that could pose a significant resistance for us. Uh, we can look at Monero versus Bitcoin, and this is just such a bullish chart. Everything looks so nice. We're back to those levels that we were a couple years ago. Um, the next spot really for us to try and hit is the 0 0.011 area. We have broken above 009, which is it's a round number, so it's significant because people like round numbers. Um, and we're essentially playing at that resistance level in between in between this spot right here and the top of that wick right there. That's how you got those two lines. So I don't know, I'm not sure I'm not sure how fast we go here. If there's a general bull market, if they're going to try and add some leverage to the market, pump the prices, if people are, are getting expectant and they're, and they're buying, and then the market makers say, hey, people are buying, let's go ahead and pump the price uh, so people have to buy at higher prices. You could see Bitcoin take a big jump, which could cause our ratio to kind of you know level off here. 
Um, that, that's speculative whether or not that happens. Bitcoin does have negative price externalities, but it is an important coin for the market makers to, to make sure they, they take care of. Uh, so here is the market cap dominance for Monero. Uh, again, we continue to be bullish. We're, we're above this area. Um, looks to me like we're going to end up trying to get above this area right here. And I think there will be some resistance. We're going to we're going to spend some time trying to work our way through that area, which is fine. Um, you don't want to chart just to go parabolic too quickly, typically. Yeah. And if, if, we you, have if, a, if Bitcoin starts pumping, like you're saying, I mean, obviously, initially, it would leave Monero behind. But do you think Monero would follow or the trend would would start to change in terms of uh, the BTC XMR ratio? Oh yeah, the, the the Monero is going to follow um, the entire crypto market if it pumps, just simply for the fact that people know about Monero, they're buying it, the exchanges are out. And so the only way that the market can actually go up right here is with organic purchasing. They need real people actually buying the market because a lot of cash has left the system at this point and there's only yeah, so guess, much leverage. And, what's that? I guess what I'm saying, would it, would it uh, still keep pace with Bitcoin or would we start to see it, you know, then, you know, we, we topped out on the BTC XMR ratio. I mean, it's, Monero continues to trend up in dollar value, but now it's like Bitcoin just keeps outpacing Monero in terms of growth if we enter a new bull market. Or do you think Monero will continue to, you know, gain gain speed on Bitcoin? I think at a minimum, Monero will continue to keep pace with Bitcoin. I think it's very possible that it that it outshines Bitcoin. That That's a very reasonable possibility. Um, I, I don't see us going into like a real true bull market. It's At best, it would be like a mini, bar, uh, mini bull market, like 2019. But yes, I think with volatility, Monero should keep pace with Bitcoin at a minimum with plenty of potential for us to go much higher, for us to continue this trend. I mean, this chart overall is, is a very bullish chart. Um, I'll need to play with uh, different ways to draw some of these lines at some point. Like for example, there's probably something to draw like that. Maybe if we go to the weekly. Um, yeah, so this wick right here, you could easily put this line down like that and we could easily draw like a, a rising triangle. And, or sorry, a rising wedge. Hmm. So yeah, we could easily draw a rising wedge right here and get above and then maybe need to break for a little bit and then play around at this level. And if if organic money starts coming into the market, real people, not just not just Tether, not just unbacked stable coins, not just Barry Silver, <laughs> but if real people start coming back into the market, the market makers like to use that. They like to front run it, right? They can see the money flowing into their exchanges. They can see people selling their stable coins and buying crypto again. And then they front run that. When they see that happening, they just slam the price up very quickly because they don't want people, they don't want the plebs getting in at low prices. They want them having to buy much higher. So this is why you see these crazy parabolic movements in crypto is a little bit of organic input causes significant leverage in the market. Um, and if that happens, yes, they're gonna put that leverage into everything except for Monero, which would hypothetically cause us problems. But you know, on the ratio. But again, Monero is so strong right now and people are buying and they don't have any left on the exchanges that if that happens, if there's organic buying, even small inputs can cause big movements on Monero's price. Um, it's not exactly short covering, but it would look kind of like short covering, which is what I believe will keep our price relative to Bitcoin pretty, pretty solid uh, with, again, with plenty of potential for us to end up going higher. So there, there will come a point this year where we have to wait, where we're going to have to kind of consolidate from this nice movement. Um, but that's not to exclude us being able to make a big move higher later on in the year. Um, and that could that could coincide with the pullback in, in a crypto market. Like if we had a hypothetical bull market or mini bull, and then that came to an end, we could see again where Monero's strength shines during bull markets like it has for the past year. So let's look at the divergences. Um, so again, this is all relative to Kraken. Uh, some of the peeps on Twitter asked me to add OKX, so they are in purple now. Um, you, a big part of the reason for our reasonably strong price action this week is you can see that these guys are trying to keep their exchange doors open. They're diverging their prices just slightly up, and they're doing volume up there. And that way, they can get that arbitration flow into their exchange, which enables them to keep their withdrawals open. Because their only other option is to show withdrawals and to keep them down. 
And that's really bad PR for Binance. I think we've actually, we've reached a lot of people and we've really exposed a lot of things. So it does look to me like they are trying to keep their withdrawals open. And in doing so is a big reason for, for why we've had um, reasonable, nice price performance um, really for the past couple months. So that's really nice to see. Hopefully, it, it looks like they've diverged downwards in the past 24 hours. Hopefully, they don't uh, keep us down there too long. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think they will. I don't think that will happen. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. I, uh, I'm optimistic. I'm very optimistic. I have reacquired my full Monero position. Maybe it was a little bit, um, a little bit hasty of me, but I don't want to miss out. You know, why? You like? Oh, Jesus, man! I would never have it in me to sell or to reacquire. To, to sell. I mean, so so you, yeah. My my, well, my narrow position uh, is always the same, essentially, just slowly trending up through. We kind of knew that some of this. We kind of knew that some of this was going to happen. You know, some of this crash yeah, business yeah, here. That was, I know. we saw that coming and I said, all right, I, if I can get more Monero, that's less Monero that the exchanges have. So it, yeah, no, I it's, it's not a bad deal. I just don't, I just don't have the uh, ability to do that. To, to no, I understand. I actually, I hadn't sold any Monero like for the entire year. And then I was like, ah, but this, I could at least make a little bit right here. I was like you, I was like, I can't do it. I just can't do it. <laughs> I mean, you obviously know what you're doing. You're good at it. You know how to do the, you know, the stop losses and all that stuff. You put the time into it. I just wouldn't have the the patience or time, you know, to to try to mess with it. And then it, it takes a lot of uh, like emotional energy too, right? You end up it takes more than just the time of doing it. It ends up eating into your life in other ways, right? Because then it becomes a concern. You're concerned about it as opposed to just having it on the back burner. It's slowly accumulating more, you know, slowly moving more fiat into, into Monero. Yep. Especially when you're leverage trading. I mean, you'll be, you'll, you'll want to wake up in the middle of the night to check your position. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not a fun game. Yeah. Uh, I don't and, like and, to leverage and trade. The, yeah. At the end of the day, are you really doing much better, you know, versus just slowly uh, accumulating? Yeah, exactly. Very few people do better. Most people just get their money taken by market makers and shady right. exchanges. So it's, here's some charts you guys will probably. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Or an asset that we, you know, that we obviously believe in, right? So like to take that risk and then at the end of the day to not have as much that you may have had if you just slowly, you know, cost average in through accumulation, it uh, it can lead to a devastating outcome. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Here's a couple more charts and I'll be, I'll finish up my segment here. Okay. Um, this is Monero versus a bunch of different coins. So this is the monthly chart that's versus Bcash. You can see we've got this nice rising wedge and then we broke above it, right? This is very bullish, uh, very bullish. Uh, we've got our chart versus Litecoin. This is kind of an inter interesting chart. I don't normally see this kind of structure, but very clear structure. Um, we basically are sitting in the top half of the range and we're knocking up, pressing up, knocking up. We're pressing up against the top of that range there uh, versus Dash. I don't even know why Dash would be relevant anymore, but rising triangle, this will probably break to the upside. No one's using Dash. Stellar, right? Here's, here's Stellar. We're, we're, we're making our way back to those all-time highs from 2017. I mean, it's, and then of course Zcash. This chart always kind of, it gets under my skin a little bit because you can see what they did. You can you can see their manipulation where they took us beneath this very clear channel. There are fundamental reasons why this channel exists and why Monero is doing better than Zcash, but they can fake it for a period of time, right? They did this whole fake out last year in November. That's that's what that was. That was so, the Barry, eh, you know. Barry Silbert special right there. You got to love his tweets too, right? Where he's like, I'm buying, oh, y'all don't like Zcash? I'm, I'm buying more. Like, hey, okay, buddy. <laughs> Sure you are. You, you got it for free. You're trying to sell it. Oh, yeah. we broke out on uh, Ripple. To liquidate a bunch of Zcash. I mean, you guys should all buy. Yeah. Yo, I got I to gotta unload my bags, guys. It's the top of the market. <laughs> I got a, I got a Charlie Lee like Litecoin, but for, but for Zcash. Not, not to change the subject real quick, but have you been following that with, with DCG? Are they, are they in trouble? I haven't been following it closely. There was a story yesterday where they're they're dissolving their investment firm that's tied to DCG. There was a um, Cameron Winklevoss publicly he posted an open letter saying, "Hey, 
you owe all of our people money. You owe us almost a billion dollars. And we're trying to talk with you. We're trying to schedule meetings. We're trying to, in good faith, approach you to see if we can resolve this. And all you're doing is obfuscating, distracting, delaying. And, oh, is it any wonder that you were previously a bankruptcy um, specialist? Maybe was he a bankruptcy lawyer? I think just a specialist. So it's like he knows the tricks of the trade. So he's using every delay tactic that he can. At the same time, I don't trust Cameron Winklevoss either. You know, it's, it's probably just posturing, you know, just one scumbag talking to another. Um, but I mean, this is, this is the systemic risk that we've been talking about for the, for the last year, uh, the contagion that, okay, so FTX went down and DCG was dependent on FTX and apparently Gemini is dependent on DCG. It's just dominoes. Um, so we'll, we'll see if they can put a floor on the market. And I think what they're doing is they're trying to wait, they're delaying, and they're hoping they can survive long enough until the market goes back up and they can get some breathing room. They might do it. It's very possible they could do it. And, you know, my moon, the moon boy in me wants them to do it because, you know, I want us to go on a little bull run right here. I, I want to make some money. Um, Monero is better positioned than the rest of these shit coins um, to do fairly well over the next coming months, even without um, a bull run from the exchanges. It would help us. It would help us to have an overall bull run, but we're still pretty well positioned. So um, I guess maybe do you guys want to take a look at uh, total crypto market cap. I don't really have anything to show you guys here um, other than just the chart. Let's go to the four hour. Yeah, I didn't really prepare anything for a total crypto market cap or for Bitcoin. Um, but this is a very long bottoming pattern. You can see that big yellow circle here. That was my target for many, many months, pretty much for most of the year. I have a circle there and maybe we're probably not going to hit it. Um, hopefully, I mean, if, if we do this, right, if we come down here, that's very likely some other big liquidation or Barry Silbert or somebody. So um, Silbert goes down. Barry Silbert. There's a guy on Twitter that has a Silbert index. It's all the coins that, that he's been shilling. He's got like Zcash. And maybe you think it's he like, owns a significant amount of Monero? I don't know. I, that, okay, so I don't. This is what I can't understand with these guys. They know. They know they're out of Monero. They know there's organic right. support. They know people. So right. why wouldn't they want to get some exposure? Are they secretly getting exposure? Right. I don't know. They have to be. I mean, I would. You know, logic would dictate. Though. Maybe that's part of the reason why you see why it seems like Monero is being held down sometimes too, right? It's like they're yeah. They're accumulating still. It's possible. Accumulate. The other thing, though, is that like these guys are most of them are scammers to some degree or another. They might be legal scammers. I'm not a lawyer, um, but people that engage in this kind of activity, they don't often have those kinds of rational thoughts. They're not like, oh, well, you know, Monero is doing good and blah, blah, blah. They're like, no, how can I save my scam? How can I continue doing this and take more money? I'm not going to get involved with that with that coin. You know, like if they were thinking rationally, a lot of these people like like Sam Bankman wouldn't be committing so many crimes. So right. it, they might not be acting in their own rational best interest. Right. And he would have been, you know, maybe slightly less successful or would have taken him a little longer of time to, to reach that level of success. But without completely yeah. destroying himself along the way. Yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting what comes out with the court case over the next months and years. Greed, man. So, uh, anything yeah. else, or shall, shall we move on? No, let's go ahead and I'll go ahead and move on. I, that's about all I got for you today. Awesome, man. Yeah, it's insane. I'm just so numb to to Mon like Monero in terms of its price. I've I've just taught myself to ignore price to such a high degree that now, <laughs> I mean, it's literally it's been an amazing year versus Bitcoin, right? It's 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 what doubled essentially. In value in terms of XMR BTC. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. I mean that's that's insane. You know, we should be jumping for joy. But I feel like we're just so used to ignoring Monero's price that it's like I have you know You have become comfortably numb. Yeah, comfortably numb. That's one hundred and forty six percent actually. Yeah. What what's the broader uh, rally? I, I I don't like the. I mean, obviously, I like the bull markets, but I feel like it just it it's more stressful than the uh, than the bear markets in a weird way for me. Mm, like, I feel like that's... you're missing out on some of these coins. Yeah, yeah. It's like, nice. yeah, you feel like, oh man, I wish I had more. As opposed to the the bear markets, I got plenty of time to accumulate. 
Well, they, they taught me to, to have my fundamental stack, to have my principled stack, but so many other, so much other crap just went crazy. I said, well, I'm not going to miss out on some of these DGEN games, so I'm going to play that game a little bit. And um, I'm not going to lie, the DGEN game is kind of what saved my profits this past bull market. So Good for you, man. All right, buddy. We will, uh, we will move on. Thank you so much, buddy. Amazing as always. Thank Great you. talking Thank with you, you, brother. Yeah. Happy New Year. Thanks, Anita. The rest of your uh, week. We'll yeah. see you in the spaces. Happy New Year. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Let's move on. Bye. To the next segment.